praise of nations. Let praise of nations rise now as a symphony to sound the endless wonders of His majesty. Let every heart adore Him, the great and small the same, through generations ever. Join together, let endless praises crown his name. All hail the King of Heaven! All hail the King of Heaven! Creation, join together, let endless praises crown his name. Said Palm Sunday. My name is Rachel Sam, and I get to welcome you today. So welcome to Plano Bible Chapel. I have lots of announcements, so hold tight. The first announcement is something that's coming up this summer. Our neighborhood Bible clubs will be happening mid-June, and you have the opportunity to volunteer and help make those happen in neighborhoods all over Plano. So there will be an all-day training on April 20th. Um, meals will be provided. That's from 10 a.m. until 10 p.m. So that'll be a long day to get you all ready for the clubs, which will happen June 10th to 14th. The rest of these events are happening this next week. Um, Easter is coming up, and we have many opportunities to gather together and prepare ourselves and get ready to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. On Friday, we'll have a Good Friday Remembrance Service. That's at 7 p.m. Then Saturday is our opportunity to serve our neighborhood um, with the community egg hunt. We still do need volunteers for that event. So if you're interested in volunteering, please see Kat Wallace or sign up with the link on the Thursday email. And then Easter Sunday, we will have no 9.30 events other than a breakfast together. So please come at 9.30 and be prepared to eat together, and then we'll celebrate um, Easter Sunday at 11 a.m. with our regular service. Um, bow your heads with me as we pray for this morning. Father God, thank you that we can meet together again, that we can worship you, and we can remind each other of the truth of who you are and how you sent your son to live on this earth and die and take our place. Father, we praise you for the opportunity to worship you once again and remember um, all the good things that you have done both in history and in this week. Lord, I ask that you would prepare our hearts today, um, Lord, as we seek to honor you through worship, and that you would prepare our hearts this week as we seek to remember the sacrifice of your son and rejoice that he rose from the grave. Father, we are eager to see the resurrection of your son, Lord, once again as we celebrate, and we are also eager uh, for our resurrection, Lord, as we are included in Christ. Father, we thank you for um, giving us this opportunity and bringing us together again. Let us turn our hearts, hearts toward you as we worship today. Amen. My name is Becky, and this is Finney, and we have the great opportunity of reading scripture this morning. This morning, we anticipate the rejection, crucifixion, and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus. Today, we think of Jesus, who died on the cross as our death substitute for our sin. Romans 5, 6 through 8. For a while, we were still helpless. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps, someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's stand. We 
make way. We make way for you.
and generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cry If 
you've been forgiven and if you've been redeemed sing the song forever to the Lamb if you walk if you walk in freedom and if you bear his name sing the song forever to the Lamb oh we'll sing the song forever Good to John Adair, one of the elders here. Would you pray with us, please? Our Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to be in a place like this, to be in a place with your people, uh, singing praises to your name, uh, remembering the Savior, uh, and uh, praying, God, for the work of your Spirit uh, in our hearts to transform and to conform us to the image of the Son. As we enter Holy Week uh, this week, uh, and we turn our attention to the cross and to the resurrection. Uh, may our attention be drawn to the Son this week. May the, our attention be drawn to his gift of his life um, and the way that he gave and gave and gave, uh, even to the end of his life. Uh, God, use that in our hearts. Uh, draw us to yourself and help us to live well and to live in light of that kind of giving. Uh, be with our pastor, Larry, as he preaches to us this morning from the word. Draw our hearts to you through that. Uh, God, we uh, are at work uh, in this church and around. We ask God for uh, your blessing on our uh, egg hunt uh, in the next few days, that it would be an opportunity to make connections with people in our community, um, and that you would draw the people to it, that you would have to be there. Uh, that uh, good conversations could be had, gospel conversations even. God, we ask uh, for the work that's going on around the world. We have uh, numerous missionaries that we uh, support. We think especially today of the Gripen Trogs and the work that they're doing in Indonesia. And we ask God that you'd bless that work and that you'd think uh, that you'd uh, uh, help them to overcome the obstacles that are there uh, with language, with transport, whatever. 
uh, but that you would uh, use them, Father, in a powerful way in the ministry that's going on there. Father, as we continue to worship this morning, we ask that you'd bless the time uh, and that it would be a, an encouragement to all who are here and that we might be encouraged not only while we're here, but to walk out and to live well in light of who you are. In Christ's name we pray and by the Spirit. Amen. Well, as our children are dismissed to the Children's Church, um, it's Palm Sunday. Let's sing Hosanna. It's a great thing to sing on Palm Sunday. It's very fitting.
as Jesus was entering Jerusalem with his disciples, the crowds gathered and uh, they were ready to crown Jesus the king, the king who would overthrow Rome. But Mark tells us in chapter 11 that when Jesus approached Jerusalem at Bethpage in Bethany near the Mount of Olives, that he sent two of his disciples and told them, go into the village ahead of you, and as soon as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there in which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Then say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here right away. So they went, and they found a colt outside the, tr- outside the street, tied by a door. They untied it, and some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing, untying the colt? And they answered them, just as Jesus had said. The Lord needs it. So they let him go. They brought the donkey to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many people spread their their clothes on the road, and others spread leafy branches cut from the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed shouted what we just sang. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna. In the highest heaven. Many people, not just the crowds, but including Jesus, Jesus' closest friends, his disciples, were anticipating a coronation. They're ready for a king on earth. But Jesus knew that the path to the crown first involved a a path to the cross. And a path to the tomb. Not just to establish his right, but to conquer sin and to reign over death for us. That's the path that Jesus followed. In fact, it's the very path that he came when we celebrate Christmas to walk down. He came not just to be great. His path includes suffering. And sacrifice. Should we expect anything less as his followers, as his disciples? The path to serving God is found in suffering and the sacrifice of the cross. Now, at first glance, who would sign up for that? (laughs) Who would sign up and say, suffering, sacrifice? No, thanks. I'll pass. Hard pass. Um, I'll look for another way out. In fact, Jesus explained this path to his disciples at least three separate times that Mark records it. The last one we find in Mark chapter 10. And I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me there. Mark chapter 10. We're going to pick up at this, this third uh, introduction, this third explanation of this path of Jesus to suffering and sacrifice on the cross. The first time uh, we we read about Jesus explaining this journey, this path to his disciples is in chapter 8 in verse 32. And in in the first time, how did the disciples respond? Well, probably just as we would, kind of defensively of, no, that can't be right. No thanks. The second time uh, we read about it in chapter 9, when they still didn't understand what Jesus meant when he said that he would he would die and then rise from the dead. They were too afraid to ask him for an, exclama- ex- an explanation of what exactly he meant. And so here in, in Mark chapter 10, right before Jesus enters Jerusalem, he tells them again, plainly, exactly what's going to happen. But still his disciples didn't understand what was coming and what it meant. Instead of giving a response of how the disciples reacted, Mark seems to indicate they just passed right by it. (laughs) They almost ignored what Jesus had to say, and two of his disciples began arguing again about who is the greatest, who would receive the positions of power and prominence and influence when Jesus became king on earth, as they expected But the lessons that Jesus taught them of discipleship are the very lessons 
that we need to continue to learn today. That the path to serving God is found in the path of suffering and sacrifice and the, cost of, and the cross of Jesus. And spoiler alert, it's worth every penny. There's a cost of being a servant. Let's pick up here in verse 32 of chapter 10 to see the cost of being a servant. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were astonished, but those who followed him were afraid. So taking the twelve aside again, he began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Verse 33, see, we're, we're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. And then they will hand him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And he will rise after three days. That's the cost of following Jesus. That's the cost of being a servant. And this path of service often involves mistreatment. The, the cost of following Jesus, this, this path of suffering and sacrifice, this, this path of being a servant, often involves misunderstanding. Jesus knew, and, and he fully knew exactly what he was doing. He had already explained it two times before. He tries to tell him again, here's what's going to happen. Here's the cost of following me and, and where we're going and what's going to happen. And he considered the cost, even as his disciples couldn't comprehend it. And in fact, at this point, they just ignored it. They skipped right over it. And often this misunderstanding is our misunderstanding as well. We want to skip to the glory and avoid the suffering. We want to get to the kingdom and avoid the sacrifice. But the, fat, the path of following Jesus as a servant is following his example, following the road that he goes on. That doesn't sound like good news <laughs> up front. But part of our life with Christ, of the glory that is coming, is some delayed gratification. Suffering before glory. Sacrifice before the resurrection. And it's worth it. The path of service often invites misunderstanding, but it always involves a mission. Jesus understood his mission clearly. In fact, there are eight different ways that he describes exactly what's going to happen. He says, see, we're going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes. They will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to Gentiles. They'll mock him, spit on him, flog him, kill him. And then he will rise again. He knew exactly what his mission was. He laid it out for them. And in the same way where we often misunderstand the clear things that Jesus says where you will be my disciples, you will be my witnesses, how often do we just skip right over that because we're focused on our own agenda, our own mission, our own plans? And instead of making the sacrifices that are required for being a servant and following his mission, we choose to follow our own. Where we say, okay, we, we know that up here, but when it comes time to actually living that out, Instead of living for Jesus, we're really just living for ourselves in the same way that the disciples were. Family and friends are often going to misunderstand us when we follow the mission of Jesus. They're going to say, ministry, what is that? Mission, what is that? Have you lost your mind? <laughs> Do you need some medication? Do you need some counseling? As if that's a bad thing. This past September, when I was in India, uh, well, Sri Lanka and India, spent 10 days with uh, a young man. Um, his name was Bhupati Kamur. Um, his, his father was the first believer in their family. And as he came to trust Christ and began to follow him, his wife even poisoned him, <laughs> trying to kill him. 
and his parents just struggled in their relationship because he watched his father follow Christ and the consequences of that. And he tried to, Bupati tried to ignore that and, and not follow Jesus for many years of his life until finally he was faced with the truth and came to believe that Jesus died on the cross for his sins and he rose from the dead and he chose to follow Jesus. And so Bupati served as our translator for just countless times. You know, so many times he would take my English and make it something much more beautiful than what I actually said. <laughs> uh, and what we, as we got to know each other, found out that he had a job offer. And the offer was not just to be a police officer, but was to be a prominent police officer. He passed his civil service exam and had a great position. It was going to come with a car, uh, with a home. And after we got back, I continued to pray for him. And I got news that they offered him this position, and he turned it down because he decided he wanted to be able to focus all of his time on telling others about Jesus. His family thought he was crazy. In fact, the, the guy who offered him the position said flat out, you are a fool. Do you have any idea what you're turning down? And he said, yes, and it's worth it. <laughs> Just a, a few months later, as Bupati was continuing to trust the Lord and follow him, he got some test results that he had blood cancer. I was wondering, Lord, why did I make all of these sacrifices for you to ruin my life? But he continued to pray and just trust the Lord. And within two weeks, he got another set of test results that there was no cancer found in his blood. How do you explain that? Was it just a bad first test? Why did God choose to heal him and not heal others? There's not a cause and effect of following the Lord and everything turns out right. In fact, it's normally just the opposite. That the path of following Jesus involves suffering and sacrifice. Often misunderstanding when we're focused on the mission of my priority in life, whether I serve as a police officer or a pastor a teacher or a missionary, an engineer or an electrician, whatever you are, whatever you do, it must involve following Jesus and living a life to lead others to know him. There's a cost of being a servant. God has a plan for your life and God has a plan for my life, whether you're eight years old or 80 years old. <laughs> and that plan is just as detailed as Jesus understood his plan was of exactly the steps and what was going to take place in his life, God knows that for you. And yet he gives us a free will. It gives you and me the free choice of whether or not we're going to follow it, whether we're going to live according to what we clearly understand and we know, or we're going to make excuses and rationalize, or whether we're going to follow what Jesus has clearly said to be his witnesses in Judea and Jerusalem, Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, but starting right where we are. There's a cost for being a servant, and it's worth it. There's also a challenge to being a servant, because being a, a servant doesn't come easily, it doesn't come naturally, especially for those of us who have been trained by our culture and by circumstances that the greatest thing you can become in the world is a leader. The greatest thing you can do is have power and position and be financially set. And so the, the challenge of being a servant oftentimes is in contradiction to the values of our world, sometimes even our family, and often the values that we have selfishly inside of us of the idols that we set up, of the things that we think are going to give us safety and security and protection uh, and identity. All those things come in conflict with this idea of being a servant and following Jesus. There's a voice inside of her head from her fallen nature that, that silently kind of whispers, the Lord takes care of those who take care of themselves. But the Bible never says that. The Bible says, 
God is with you wherever and whatever you're doing. And when we follow the Lord and his will according to his word, not how we want to misrepresent it, misrepresent it, but what he says, then he will carry us through it. James and John had a request. Verse 35, James and John, the son of Zebedee, approached him and said, Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask you. So what do you want me to do for you? He asked them. They answered him, Allow us to sit at your right hand and your left hand in your glory. (laughs) Jesus said to them, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Verse 39, We are able, they told him. And Jesus said, You will drink the cup I drink. And you will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those whom it has been prepared. James and John got got one thing right, but everything else wrong. They're correct in their understanding that, that Jesus is headed toward glory. When they said, allow us when you come in your glory. They got that right. He's coming to glory. But how that glory would come... They just ignored. They had a complete understanding of what Jesus had said about the crucifixion, about the resurrection. Most of all, their request to sit at the right hand and the left hand, this position of power and influence, was totally selfish. Jesus had promised the the 12 disciples that they would sit on 12 12 thrones with him in, in his kingdom. That, however, wasn't enough just to be one of the 12. They wanted the top two positions because that's what the world and our selfishness says that's the best place to be. Make it your ambition to be in a place of of power, influence, honor, recognition. But it revealed their selfishness. And the challenge for us is we must come face to face with that as well. That being a servant conflicts often with our human ambitions. Being a servant conflicts with our human ambitions. Their request for power and position in the kingdom of heaven. And and what this request reveals is their supernatural or, excuse me, superficial understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. It also reveals their inflated opinion of their own importance. And the wrong view of how God measures greatness. Exactly what Jordan Brown preached about last week. The second time that Jesus talked about the cross and the resurrection. They still didn't get it. There was still this conflict within them of misunderstanding God's word and their ambitions. Because being a servant goes against all of our human inclinations and all of our human ambitions. It's often counter to our opinion of ourselves. But what Jesus is saying to his disciples, including us, is that being a servant after the the pattern of Jesus is a divine enablement, not our natural human inclination. And so if we're just going to focus on ourselves, we're going to be outside of what it is that God wants us to be. If we're thinking about our future only, if we're thinking about only our jobs, if we're thinking only about our health, and not, God, what are you doing? What do you want me to do? Who's the person that you want me to be? We're going to be constantly in conflict with Jesus himself. Being a servant means following Jesus not only to glory, but to sacrifice and suffering. So at the time of the Lord's greatest glory, the disciples were wanting to be on his right hand and his left hand. But in reality, at the time of Jesus' greatest glory on the cross, it wasn't James and John. It was two thieves who were on his right hand and left hand, crucified with him. Being a servant conflicts with our human ambitions, but being a servant 
the kind that Jesus wants for you, the kind that, of servant that Jesus wants me to be, is clarified specifically by Jesus' own divine revelation. What did he say? In verse 38, he says, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Jesus compares his approaching suffering and death to this cup of wrath, this, this idea that carries the Old Testament judgment of God for sin. And when he talks about his baptism, it's being overwhelmed, flooded, immersed in the destiny planned for Jesus by his Father. And that's the plan and direction that God has for us. Suffering and sacrifice. And so James and John and the rest of their disciples, their, their all-too-quick answer makes plain that, that James and John and the other disciples, they still just didn't get it. When in reality, James would be the first of the disciples to be martyred. We read about this in Acts chapter 12. John, his brother, would, would experience alone the great persecution of Domitian and be exiled to the island of Patmos. Sacrifice, suffering, is exactly what James and John experienced. But to choose who sits on the right hand or left hand of God is a decision reserved only for the Father. And sadly for James and John, they failed to see that the pathway to glory is through the path of suffering and sacrifice. That's the challenge for us. Third, there's a conflict of being a servant. We read in the next verse, verse 41, that the rest of the ten disciples were pretty upset with these guys. When the ten disciples heard, that, heard this, that is what James and John had to say, they began to be indignant with James and John. And Jesus called them over and said to them, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those in high positions act as tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you will be slave to all. Jesus took this opportunity to teach his disciples, all of them, a lesson. It just doesn't seem to make sense to them. And so Jesus had to make it clear. Because by all earthly standards, self-promotion is the way to get it. Exactly what James and John did. The world would say, hey, what's wrong with that? You should be ambitious. You should have goals. You should have plans. You're not going to get it unless you ask for it. So what's the harm in asking? So here's the conflict in being a servant. That Jesus says the way to greatness, the way to be a servant is saying no to selfishness. In fact, selfishness is our default mode as sinful people. It, we're, we're hardwired because of Adam and Eve's sin and what was passed down to us to be sinners who sin. And the greatest expression of that is often our selfishness. And so the conflict of being a servant is saying no to the ways of selfishness. In the world, the more important you are, the more people serve you. But Jesus saying is that in the kingdom, it must not be that way with you. In the kingdom, the more people you serve, the greater you are in the kingdom. In Jesus' kingdom, the most important people are those who selflessly sacrificially serve him and serve others. On the other hand, Jesus says that in addition to saying no to selfish, selfishness, that we say yes to the work of being a servant. Do you want to be great? Do you want to do something great for the Lord? Do you want to be great in the kingdom? After all, that's really what James and John were asking about. Of Lord, how do I be great in your, in your world? In the kingdom that's coming, how do I stand out? How do I be unique and, and be different? Jesus says, be a servant. Become a slave to others. 
Do you want to please and honor the Lord with your life? Then be a servant. I don't know if you've looked for a job recently and tried to find the place to be a servant. Have any of you done that? Done a job search trying to find a servant? Okay, a couple of you. That, that title isn't necessarily out there, and it's not one that has a great pay rate. Not a, not a fantastic retirement plan. Because that's not what our world says you should aspire to be. But Jesus says, if you want to be great in the kingdom, on contrary, whoever wants to become great among you will be a servant. And such a person will have the mindset, the attitude of Christ, who being the very form of a servant in humility came and served us, even sacrificed his life for us. A servant serves others when it, even when it isn't convenient. A servant serves people that he or she doesn't particularly like. A servant serves when he or she dislikes the work. Serves anyway. A servant serves even when he or she receives no personal satisfaction or no attention for doing it. That's the contrast of being a servant. And it's the conflict that goes on within each and every one of us. Because we'd rather serve when it's convenient rather than when it's inconvenient. We'd rather just serve the people that we like or love and really don't want to serve people that don't like us or don't even know us or ignore us. We'd rather serve in the areas where, where we find satisfaction, where, where we really like the work, rather than where there's a need or where there's an opportunity. We'd rather serve in a position or a place where we get some recognition, where we get a pat on the back, where we're re rewarded financially or in some way. But a servant abandons all of that to serve the king who knows it all, who says, whoever wants to be great among you will be a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all. Jesus reverses all the ideas of greatness that we learn in preschool and that are rewarded to our grave. So who will we say yes to? Will we say yes to being selfish and serving ourselves or the Lord? It'll be a battle of the flesh. It'll be a battle, a, a conflict within us where we want some attention. We want somebody to notice us. You know, one of the difficult things in where we are as opposed to James and John, is they could see Jesus face to face. How do we talk to God? By prayer. How does he talk to us? Through his word. And if you're anything like me, there are times when we read things in his word, you're like, mm, no, I think I'll, I'll just skip that. I'd rather not give that any thought. Let, let's, let's move on. What's next? When in reality, the way that the Lord speaks to us by his spirit is the same way that he spoke to James and John. Whoever wants to be great in the kingdom of God, are you ready to pick up a towel? Are you ready to get a, weight, a wash basin? Are you ready to do the things that are going to be ignored and forgotten by others that may not bring you any recognition here on earth, but the things that will last? Why should we choose to be a servant? Who would sign up for this? <laughs> well, not many people, actually. But if we're to stop and think, why would we want to become a servant? Why would we follow Jesus to the cross of sacrifice and suffering? Well, here's the reason. It's in the last verse that we're going to consider this morning. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Why? For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve 
and to give his life as a ransom for many. Why do we choose this path of being a servant? Because Jesus Christ, our Savior, is our suffering servant. That he served us. He sacrificed and gave his life for us so that we would follow him in a life of sacrifice and serving for him. Jesus makes a promise that, that no other religious leader in the world has made or could make. That he came to, to serve you and me, not just for our earthly benefit, but to pay our ransom. Now, ransom isn't something that was paid to Satan. It wasn't something that, that was done to free us from the bondage of, of our enemy. It was to pay the price of our sin. That throughout the Old Testament, when the Israelites sinned, God asked them to make a sacrifice. And when they made that sacrifice, by faith, it was a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And that sacrifice came with a cost. It wasn't something that was their leftovers. It wasn't a blemished lamb or a bird with a broken wing. It was their best. It had a cost. And they made the sacrifice. In the same way, Jesus is our atoning sacrifice who paid the price, the cost of our sin. And he proved that he had the right to do that three days later by rising from the dead. That's a story for another Sunday. <laughs> Jesus' service to us extended to giving his life for us. So what do we do? What is it Jesus is asking us? To live in the same way that he lived. To follow Christ in service to God. For even, Jesus said, for even the Son of Man. This emphasizes the, the humility and the service of the one who should, by all rights, be honored and glorified. But instead, he suffered at the, the hands of the chief priests and the scribes. He was condemned to death. He was turned over to the Gentiles who, who mocked him, spit on him, flogged him, and killed him. Ultimately, our service to God isn't to bring attention to ourselves, but it's to bring recognition to him. You know, one of the things that, that we're doing this week in our egg hunt is we're partnering with another church, Northeast Bible Church, just down Shiloh and take a ride on 14th Street. It's right there, Northeast Bible Church. We're partnering together at the egg hunt at Foreman next Saturday. And one of the reasons, among many, that we're doing that is because we're not serving at Foreman Elementary to promote the name of Plano Bible Chapel. We're serving at Foreman Elementary to promote the name of Jesus. And by doing this together as like-minded churches, brothers and sisters in Christ, we can easily say, hey, we're not trying to grow our church. We're not trying to grow our brand. We're not trying to make our name great in the community. We want to point people to Jesus. And we want to do this by following Christ in service to him. And we're going to do it together as the body of Christ. We sacrifice and we serve, not so people notice that we are sacrificing and serving. We serve and sacrifice so that people will see Jesus. That's the reason we do it. And anytime we're doing it to get attention to ourselves, either sympathy, sympathy or, or recognition, <laughs> we're missing out on the reason that we're to sacrifice and serve, to bring glory to God. Jesus Christ is our suffering servant, and we follow Christ to serve him. Secondly, we follow Christ and sacrifice for others. Do you want to be great? Do you really want to be a leader in your world? Do you want to be a leader in this church, in this, in this community? Do you want to have a position in heaven that is there forever? Follow the path of Jesus, serving when it's not convenient, serving when you really don't care for the work, serving when you don't like the job, serving when you don't like the people, serving when there's no recognition, there's no benefit from it here on earth, serving because Jesus served us. The path to serving God is found in the sacrifice and suffering of the cross. 
And here's what I love about this, that this could be a real downer of a message that's heavy, but it's this path of sacrificing and serving that leads to joy. It's the path of sacrificing and serving that is playing the long game, <laughs> that is looking to eternity, to our resurrection, to our time in serving the Lord, to serving when he is recognized as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the King. The author of Hebrews tells us this, for the joy that lay before Jesus, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of heaven. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary and give up. The reason that we love this path of sacrifice and service is not because of the sacrifice and service, but it's because of the joy that comes from following and knowing Jesus. We're not weirdos who just love suffering and misery. That's nuts. That is foolish. No, we do this because of the joy of Christ. And the joy that lays before us because we're following the one who endured the cross, scorning its shame with joy because that meant we by faith could be with him forever. The path to joy is not what the world says. The path to joy is that of sacrificing for the Lord and serving others for him. Let's pray. Our Father, we're grateful for the truth of your word that continues to speak to us today. Uh, Lord, I recognize I'm like James and John. (laughs) Um, I don't always get your message. Um, We miss the point. We're selfish. We're sinners. Um, We continue to look for things in this world that will bring us satisfaction and security. When over and over again you say in your word that our ultimate uh, satisfaction and security is found in you alone. And so, Father, we ask uh, for forgiveness. When we confess our selfishness and our sinfulness of serving ourselves and, and Areas that are comfortable and convenient and the the people that we like. And so, Lord, by the power of your spirit, enable us to no longer live for ourselves, but live for Christ, who for our sakes died and was raised. Be glorified in us and through us. Lord, continue to to help us understand the, the eternal hope and the eternal joy of serving you and serving others. Lord, for for those who are in uh, places this morning where we're making decisions of what we're planning and how we're going to spend our time and our money and our resources, Lord, lead us to invest in your eternal kingdom, whether it's by our time or by our money, Lord, to set our hope on things above, where one day we will be rewarded, not in the way that the world rewards, but in the way that you reward those who are great in your kingdom, servants and slaves who give. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who came to serve us and who gave his life as a ransom for us at great cost and great suffering with great joy. And in Christ's name, we pray this by the power of your spirit. Amen. Well, this morning, let's remember, let's celebrate around this table Christ's sacrifice and his suffering for us. The bread simply reminding us an object lesson of Christ's body hung on the cross. The cup, a picture of God's wrath and judgment poured out on Christ for us so that we could be forgiven and set free. If you have placed your trust in Christ, I invite you to come to this table as John will serve you. The table's on the side. If you're physically not able to get up this morning, please just raise your hand and someone will come and serve you where you are. If you're in the balcony, someone will serve you where you're seated. Come to this table, and after everyone's been served, we'll eat and drink together.
five days after Jesus entered Jerusalem to the shouts of Hosanna, he sat down to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. And as they were eating, he took bread, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, take and eat, this is my body. Let's eat together. And then Jesus took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. He said to them, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for you, for many. And truly, I tell you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let's drink together. One of the things I'm so thankful for about serving with you, Plano Bible Chapel, is how many faithful servants there are here who are regularly and routinely making sacrifices and serving the Lord and serving others. I was here just yesterday with so many of you that were here serving in areas that maybe you didn't even get, a rec get recognition. Nobody knew what you were doing, but you were here and you were serving. Others of you were serving elsewhere, and others of you, if you could have, would have been here. This next Saturday at Foreman Elementary, we're going to have an egg hunt serving our community, making sacrifices to be a part of that. This summer, we're going to be serving in our neighborhoods during neighborhood Bible clubs. And we're, we're at the place where we're asking for servants to sacrifice. We've been talking for uh, several months about some of the needs of our church body here for our general fund and for giving to our renovations. Many of you are sacrificing and giving. Thank you so much. For those of you who have a ways to go. Join us, get involved, get connected, show up, say no to other things so you can say yes to opportunities to serve, not just here to make the name of Plano Bible Chapel great, but to make the name of Jesus great. So go into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, honor all men, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak. Help the suffering and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. See you Friday night for our Good Friday service. Have a great day.